Welcome to our services here at Springdale Free Will Baptist Church. This is the last Sunday of April 2022, and it seems like these first four months have just flown by so quickly. I just am glad to welcome each and every one of you, those who are here in person, as well as those watching by way of our recording. I'm preaching this morning about angels, and we're going to start off with the verse in Hebrews chapter 13, and we'll read the second verse. Then we'll have a word of prayer, and then I'll begin the message. Hebrews 13, verse number 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Let's bow our heads and hearts in a word of prayer, shall we? Thank you, Heavenly Father. We love you, and we know that you love us, and you sent your Son, Jesus, to die upon the cross of Calvary. I'm glad as we celebrated on Easter Sunday that the grave couldn't hold him, but he rose again victorious. After three days and three nights in the grave, he rose again and showed himself alive uh, through his uh, resurrection to many, many, many people for 40 days. We thank you that as we're studying the word this morning, this word that we are about to receive, uh, I thank you for the scriptures. I pray, dear Lord, that we could somehow push aside the cares and the thoughts of this world and begin to focus upon you and your eternal precepts. Please forgive me of my sins. Forgive all of us, Lord, because we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Lord, as you forgive us, please use us. Help us to be pliable. Help us to be sensitive to the leading of your Holy Spirit. And then help us to love you more and more each day and also to love others, dear Lord, as you would have us love them. We thank you, dear Lord, that you do supply angels to help us in many, many ways and many times that we don't see. That at times we might entertain strangers, but they're really angels that we've entertained or been in their presence unawares. And I thank you, dear Lord, that I'm not here to worship angels. I'm not bringing glory to them because their job is to bring you glory and do your will. And Lord, in many ways, we have the same job. Our calling is to bring you glory and to obey you and do your will. Help us to learn a little bit from the ministry of these angels, dear Lord, so that we can love you even more and, and also be aware that there are ways when we can minister to others as well. And I ask all this in the precious name, the most precious name in this whole universe, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. Well, I want to share with you a story that I don't think it's true, but it's somewhat funny. So if you don't mind, I'll share it with you anyway. Once there was a man who, he was such a golf addict that it seemed like he just wanted to golf anytime the weather was nice and pretty. And so frequently he would call in to work saying that he was sick when instead he was really out on the golf course. Well, one morning after making his usual call to the office, an angel up above spotted him on the way to the golf course and decided to teach this guy a lesson. The angel whispered in his ear, if you play golf today, you will be punished. Well, the man thought, oh, maybe it's just my conscience playing tricks on me. He had successfully kept down that consciousness uh, in the past of saying, yeah, I should be at work, but no, I'd rather play golf. So he just sort of smiled and, and he said out loud, no, I've been doing this for years. No one will ever know. I won't be punished. Well, the angel said no more, and the fellow stepped up to the first tee where he promptly whacked a ball about 300 yards straight down the middle of the fairway. Since he had never driven the ball more than 200 yards, he couldn't believe it. Yet there it was, and his good fortune continued. Long drives on every hole, perfect putting. By the ninth hole, he was six under par and was playing a near-perfect golf game. It seemed like he was walking on air. He wound up with an amazing score of 61, about 30 strokes under his usual score. He couldn't wait until he got back to the office to tell his co-workers about this. But suddenly the joy left him. He couldn't tell them. He could never tell anyone. And the angel smiled. <laughs> well, the Bible teaches us that angels are the servants of God and you and I should also be God's servants. I want us to look at seven characteristics of angels in their ministry according to the Bible. 
If you still have your Bible open there to Hebrews chapter number uh, 13, if you'll just back up one chapter and go to chapter number 12, the 22nd verse talks about angels as well. We find, number one, that there is an innumerable company of angels. They're innumerable in number. We couldn't count that high. Hebrews 12, 22, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. I don't know that God even takes a census, because he doesn't need to. He knows how many are serving him and how many are not. He knows everything about them, and he knows everything about you and I. He's God. Amen? He's God, and we ought to worship him as God. They are innumerable in number. A second thing that I find in the scripture is these angels are mighty in power. Mighty in power. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1 tells us a little bit about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there, he's coming with his mighty angels. Let's look at verses 7 and 8. They're mighty in power. Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I imagine sometimes you and I wonder, Lord, why don't you stop all this evil that's in the world? There's so much evil and so much wickedness, so much sin, so many people that, that are living so wickedly, and how can they get away with it? But let's understand that one day, Judgment Day is coming. We don't know when, but we know for sure that that is coming. God says we have an appointment unto that. We have an appointment unto the time of our death and also to a day of judgment and reconciliation. And the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation on that great white throne judgment day that all the books will be opened. And those who are lost, those who are dead, will be judged out of those books. But for those who are born again children of God, who walk with God by faith, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus paid that sin debt for us so that we're not judged to see whether we're saved or not. There will be the judgment seat of Christ where Christ will determine whether we get our rewards or not. That's based on our faithful service to him, but we're already in heaven. We're already saved. And that great white throne judgment is for the lost and also for the devil and those evil, wicked uh, uh, devils or uh, bad angels that uh, fell from heaven along with him. But angels are mighty in power. Number three, angels have a glorious appearance. In Matthew 28, verses 2 and 3, on the day of resurrection, and we talked about this on Easter Sunday. It says in this passage, and behold, there were, was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance, that means appearance, his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. When the lightning is flashing, it's so brilliant, it lights up the entire sky, especially if it strikes pretty near you. <laughs> that can be pretty scary. But angels have a glorious appearance. They radiate in light. The Bible does caution us, though, that even Satan and his evil angels sometimes will appear to us as angels of light, and we've got to be careful that we're not deceived by them. So far, we've seen that there is an innumerable number of angels. They are mighty in power. They have a glorious appearance. And the Bible in Hebrews 1 calls them ministering spirits. Hebrews 1 verse 14. It says, Are they not all ministering spirits set forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? I don't know how often angels have helped me, but I believe they have. I really do. I've had some close calls in my life. Once driving down Highway 78, now Interstate 22, I hydroplaned. It was pouring down rain. It was on a curve. My vehicle went sideways, and all I could do was call upon the name of Jesus. 
And somehow he helped me to keep that car from spinning around and around. There were semis in front of me, one in the lane beside me, and one behind me. <laughs> and I believe it was the hand of the Lord that saved me. There are other times, not just for me, but members of my family and friends and, and others that I've talked to that I believe angels have ministered to in one way or another. But they are in a realm that you and I can't see. We can see what's in this physical world, and it's only when angels are allowed to appear before us that they can be seen. You remember that the angel Gabriel came and appeared to Daniel, gave him messages. Angel appeared to Jacob, and to, uh, angels appeared to, uh, in the New Testament time to, to the disciples and to the women there on Resurrection Day. Angels are, are appearing to the book of John throughout the book of Revelation to give him instructions from the word of God. They are called ministering spirits. That's what Hebrews 1.14 tells us. Well, we know that angels also ministered to the Lord when he was here on the earth, didn't they? The Bible tells us in the fourth chapter of Matthew that Jesus went out into the wilderness and 40 days and 40 nights he did not eat. And there he was tempted of the devil. The Bible shows us that Jesus resisted the temptation by quoting Scripture. And then the Bible tells us, this is about the 11th verse, it says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. We also know that it says that the devil left him for a season. I know Jesus was tempted many, many, many times. That's what the Bible indicates to us. So they are called ministering spirits. Also, when Jesus prayed for you and me and for his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Luke 22, verse 43, talking about him praying there in the garden and, and agonizing in prayer, wondering, uh, Father, if it be possible you know, to, to let this pass from him. But here's what we, we find in that uh, 22, 30, uh, 43rd verse. It says, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Yes, they are ministering spirits. Even Jesus needed some of their assistance from time to time. In fact, it's interesting that uh, angels are mentioned 23 times in the Gospel of Luke. And they're mentioned over 230 times throughout all of the scriptures. Moving on to number five, angels supply the needs of God's people. And for this, we go back into the Old Testament books of the Kings. The first one I'll mention is in 1 Kings chapter 19, and then when we get to 2 Kings 19, we find angels ministering there again. In 1 Kings chapter 19, we have the story of what happened after Elijah built the altar to God and prayed and asked God to send down fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice. That's after they dumped 12 barrels of water on that altar on the sacrifice. The wood was soaked. There was a trench dug around it, and all that water uh, was there. And when God sent down the fire from heaven as Elijah prayed, everything disappeared. The sacrifice was gone, the wood was gone, the stones were gone, the water was gone, and the dust around that altar was gone. And so Elijah did what God told him to do, and he slew 450 prophets of Baal, these false prophets. And then Queen Jezebel, the most wicked queen ever upon this earth, heard about it, and she sent word to Elijah, I'm going to do to you what you did to my prophets. And instead of Elijah staying strong, he began to doubt. And he left in fear. He ran. And he continued out further and further away. He ran away from Jezebel until he was exhausted. And the Bible says he fell asleep under a juniper tree. This is, uh, I'm not going to read all these verses, but it's in 1 Kings chapter 19, mostly in verses 4 through 8. But the Bible does tell us two times in those verses that an angel from the Lord brought him food and said, Arise and eat. He slept, the angel woke him, he ate, and he drank, and he fell asleep again. And so later on, the angel woke him again and said, Arise and eat. The angel was there as a ministering spirit to help him. And God told Elijah, Your work isn't done. I still have things that you need to do. And so Elijah eventually went back and did what God commanded him to do. 
In 2 Kings 19, we have the story, and I will read these verses. In the days of Elisha, who was the prophet after Elijah was taken on up into glory. In 2 Kings 19, starting in the 32nd verse, we find that the armies of the king of Assyria had come and there were 185,000 soldiers threatening to move upon God's people. In verse 32, read three, I'll read through verse 35. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a, blank, a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city. God handled the problem. God showed Elisha that he was in control, and that 185,000 strong army would be destroyed by the Lord. Aren't you glad that we have the ministry of God and his angels? One angel destroyed 185,000 soldiers of the Assyrians in one night. <laughs> I want to go on and read just a little bit further. And I, I did miss the last couple words of that verse. I'll go back and read verse 33 again. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. Now let's move on to 34 and 35. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Now, I'm not, uh, this verse is not saying that those dead people woke up in the morning and found that they were all dead. This, these are God's people. As they woke up and uh, rose that next morning, they found that this army had been destroyed. That's good. God sent his angels as ministering spirits, as servants. And my point number five was that they supply the needs of God's people. Here are a couple other examples from the book of Acts. In Acts chapter number 12, Peter had been imprisoned and was close to being executed. That was the plan. But God sent an angel that night, along with an earthquake. The doors of the prison of bars were loosened up. They opened up. The chains on Peter fell off. And the angel basically had to kind of prod Peter and, and get him going. Said, come on, get up. You know, you're, go, you're free. And during that time, those believers were in Jerusalem gathered together in an upper room. And they were praying for Peter. And the Bible says in Acts 12, 11, Peter said, Now I know for a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod. By the way, the story goes on to tell us that Peter arrived there, and, and not only were the doors of the house shut, but evidently they had some sort of a gate uh, that was shut as well. And Peter was out there knocking and knocking and, and, and hollering, wanting them to open up that God had answered their prayer. And finally, a servant girl uh, went to open it up and she saw that it was Peter, and she ran in to tell the rest of them in their prayer meeting and said, Peter's here. No, they basically said, no, he's not. You know, we're praying for him. He's locked up in prison. No, he's here, and he was. God sent an angel to let Peter out of prison. Later on in the book of Acts, this is in chapter 27, and I'll read 23 and 24. In this account, we have the apostle Paul, who is on board ship. He was being taken uh, to Rome to stand trial, and, and he spent about two years in Rome before he was executed. But there on board the ship, they, the storm had come up. The winter storms come quickly on the Mediterranean, and it was breaking the ship apart. They threw all the cargo overboard. They threw everything that they could get a hold of overboard, and they were still being tossed, and they believed that they were going to die that night. Paul has some good news for them. Verse 23 of chapter 27 of Acts, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. He was able to tell them, Don't be afraid. The ship is going down, but if you'll stick with me, not one of us will lose our lives. That's exactly what happened. God's angel told Paul, don't worry, I'm with you. 
Isn't that a comfort to know? In fact, I preached a message several weeks ago uh, that I, I was preaching about Jesus so often was saying to cheer up or be of good cheer. Oftentimes, the, the message of, of the Lord Jesus is, is, don't be afraid, cheer up, be happy. The Lord is with you. And many times, the message of the angels was, fear not. Isn't that the thing that the angels said to the shepherds? According to Luke chapter 2, they were out in the fields taking care of their flocks, and the angel said, fear not. Well, the angel told the apostle Paul, fear not. Those are great words of comfort. There are two final points that I'd like to share about angels. Some angels are evil. And then my seventh point in a moment will be some angels are good. Some angels are evil. These are what we call demons or demonic spirits or as our King James Bible puts it, devils. In Ezekiel chapter 28, in that chapter it describes about Lucifer. That was Satan's name before he rebelled against God before he fell. Soon, uh, Lucifer was the most magnificent of all the angels in heaven. He was supposed to be the worship leader, to lead the angels in the worship of God, but there was pride found in his heart. He said, I want to be like God. I want to get up to the throne. I want to, I want to take over. And of course, he wasn't able to, and he was cast down. In Revelation 18, in the second verse, it mentions about these demonic spirits. It called them foul spirits. It talks about every foul spirit. In 2 Peter 2, verse 4, Peter talked about how God spared not the angels that sinned, but he cast them down and reserved them in chains of darkness until the time of judgment. So there were some angels that God has bound in that bottomless pit, essentially. And that's exactly where the devil's going to spend a thousand years when Christ is ruling and reigning here on this earth. In Revelation chapter 12, we studied that last year. And in that chapter, it tells about war in heaven. That there was war, and the war was going on uh, between Michael the archangel of God, the, the warrior angel, and, uh, and the angels in heaven fought against the dragon, the serpent, the devil, Satan, fought against him and his angels. And there was that great conflict. And of course, God always wins in the end. He lets that devil do some things and many things. But in the end, the devil's going to be in that lake of fire forever and ever. There are some evil demons or evil spirits. In Revelation chapter 20, in the 10th verse, it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Never hear from him again. Isn't that good news? I'm tired of this old devil and all the wickedness that he brings upon this earth. So far, as we've talked about angels this morning, I shared with you that there is an innumerable number of angels. Also, they're mighty in power. They have a glorious appearance. They are called ministering spirits. They supply the needs of God's people. Some are evil, those demons. And then lastly, some are good. And by the way, um, according to what Revelation would indicate to us, that about a third of the angels rebelled with Satan. Those are the evil angels. And that would mean about two-thirds of the angels then are still considered good angels. They're God's servants. In Hebrews chapter number 12, and I know we were in chapter number 12 and verse 22 a little while ago, I just want to remind you again about that verse. I said, some are good. In Hebrews 12, 22, it says that we're come to an innumerable company of angels. God's good angels cannot be numbered by us. God could, but we couldn't number them. There are so many of them. In Revelation chapter number 5, verse number 11, John is describing the things that he sees and the things that he hears in heaven. And in chapter number 5, he sees the throne, he sees the things around the throne and what is going on. In verse 11 of Revelation 5, John writes this, And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders... The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. I don't know how many that is, but it's a lot. Hebrews 1 verse 6, we read, And let all the angels of God worship him. 
That's what God created the angels to do. Talking about Jesus, let all the angels of God worship Him. Folks, we ought to worship Him too. I said at the beginning of the message that angels are servants of God. We ought to be the servants of God. Angels are to worship God. Folks, we ought to worship God. I'm not trying to say that we're going to become an angel. I don't want to be an angel. I'm better than an angel in a sense that one day I'm going to receive a new body like the glorious body of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the promise of the resurrection body. I want that. I'm not going to sprout wings. I'm not going to fly around in heaven using wings. But I think if we can do what Jesus did, he could pass into a room when the windows and doors are shut, and he could be instantly moving from one place to another. I think we're not going to need wings. I think we're going to be jumping over and hopping over the clouds and running down those golden streets in heaven just shouting hallelujah, praise the Lamb, glory to God in the highest. And I think it's going to be the most wonderful, wonderful time that we could ever imagine. I want to share with you this story, and I know Edith has told me something similar about this, uh, not necessarily this same person, but uh, a similar story. This is about a missionary by the name of John Patton. At the age of 12, John Patton of Scotland accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. He decided that he wanted to be a missionary, and he decided to work in the New Hebrides Islands. He and his wife Mary landed on the island of Tan in November of 1858, and he built a small house there. In those days, the natives of Tana were cannibals. The missionary couple lived among painted savages, this is a quote from him, painted savages who were enveloped in the superstitions and cruelties of heathenism as it's at its worst. During the time that they were there, there was an epidemic of disease that was spreading throughout the island. The natives blamed the missionaries. So one night, the native warriors got together and surrounded the mission station, intending on burning out the patents and killing them. John and his wife Mary prayed during that terror-filled night that God would deliver them. When daylight came, they were amazed to see that their attackers left. About a year later, the chief of the tribe was converted to Jesus Christ, and John Patton, remembering what had happened that one night, he asked the chief what kept him and his men from burning down their house and killing them. The chief replied in surprise, Who were those men you had with you there? The missionary answered, There were no men there, just my wife and I. The chief argued that they had seen many men standing guard, hundreds of men in shining garments with drawn swords in their hands. They seemed to circle the mission station so that the natives were afraid to attack, and only then did John Patton realize that God had sent his angels to protect them. He explained that to the chief, and the chief agreed that must have been what happened. God has a way of protecting us. John and his wife couldn't see those angels, but those natives sure could see them, and they were scared to death. I'm glad God's on our side, or I probably should say it a better way, that we are on his side. It's not that we need to convince God to get on our side. We just need to make sure that we're living according to his scripture, that if we live according to what the book says and follow the teachings of this precious divine book, that we will be under the hand and protection of God. He wants to protect us. He knows that we're not strong enough to survive on our own. But with the Lord's help, we're going to make it. Even through the bad times, even through the times of trial, through the times of sorrow, heartache, fear, and distress, and catastrophe. And even when there might be the death of a loved one or a close friend, God will sustain us through that time. So that one day, as believers, when we come to the point of it being our time to leave this world. And it could be through a dread disease, through an accident, could be something horrible that happens. We don't have to worry because we do have the assurance that God is going to carry us over. In fact, the Bible sort of alludes to the idea that angels carry God's people over to the other side. 
Isn't that an amazing thing? I don't worship angels. And you know, I, I'm just amazed that there's so many people that have statues of angels, but almost all of them look like women. And every time you read about an angel in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, they're appearing like a man. So this idea of the long hair and, and sort of feminine features and all, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> Remember, John Patton and his wife heard from the chief that there were hundreds of men in white with their swords drawn. So don't let the world reshaping your idea of God and his ministering spirits called angels. I just would rather stick with what the Word of God says. And we just have to worship God. I thank him for his angels. I thank him for his people. We've got God's people here. As in the song I sang earlier about angels among us, sometimes God uses people as his ministering spirits as well. We don't always understand how God works. But that little boy in the story in that song said there was a man that led him home. He was getting late. He was afraid. He had lost his way. Mama couldn't see the man, but he said he was there. God's there. Whether you can see him or not, God is with you. His angels are there. And the Bible promises that the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. Just believe what God says. Amen? Just believe it and live according to it. All right, let's all bow in a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we do so rejoice in your love for us. Lord, I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve your mercy. I don't deserve your grace. I know I don't deserve heaven. Lord Jesus, yet you died for me on the cross of Calvary. You took my place. Lord Jesus, you shed your blood for me. And you have an invitation now to whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. And, and you promise us that if we'll just draw nigh unto you, you'll draw nigh unto us. You promise the salvation for all. As that beautiful verse in John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done, for all that you will do. And Lord, I look forward to the day when I leave this earth and I come home to live with you in the mansions of glory. I know, as was sung by a lady in our church today, Oh Lord, I know, I have no friend like you. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's golden shore, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I love you, Jesus. I love your people. I love your word. And I love that you sent angels as ministering spirits from time to time to help us. I thank you for the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit who teaches us and re reminds us of things we may have forgotten as we study the Word of God and, and hold on to its precious truths. But now, dear Lord, I want to ask you, according to your will, as the Scriptures say, Lord, would you please save those who are lost it tells me in the scriptures as I read that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lord, I pray that people would repent of their sin. Use this message, use this scripture, dear Lord, as you see fit. I don't want any glory, but Lord, I pray that you get all the glory and the praise. And that some lost people will get saved by hearing the preaching of the word of God and heeding the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I want to again thank you and praise you for everything you've done. I pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen.